Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 16th episode of Security and Crumpets, where we host security professionals each month to talk about different security topics. Today, I'm delighted to have Marissa Fagan on the show. Marissa is a security culture expert and is the head of trust culture and training at Alassian. That's a, that's a big one to say. Previously, she has worked at Facebook, Bug Crowd, Salesforce, and Synopsys. In various roles, she has um, done such roles such as product security lead, EPM, and director of crowd operations. Marissa is the co-founder of Bay Threat, an MBT conference in the Bay Area, and she's presented at conferences such as DEF CON, QCON, B-Sides, and she was also the instructor at Black Hat Trainings for a course of building security programs, which is a great thing because we're going to talk a lot about that today. Welcome, Marissa. Welcome to the stream. Thank you so much, and it is so wonderful to see you. I can't believe it has been two years since I've seen you and probably anybody else. Um, but yeah, it's it's so good to see you. I know it's been in a just shy of two years since the last time me and Marissa have seen each other. So we originally met in the San Francisco office at Synopsys, and obviously I love the city. I no longer live there. Um, but I would still like, obviously, you know, what has that been like, you know, in the last two years, is it now coming back to the world or? Yeah, things over here are opening back up and the numbers are good. Everybody's become very well versed in this sort of risk assessment, which has been interesting to watch from a risk professional perspective. Um, but yeah, the weather's good. Things are looking up. Wonderful. And, you know, I, obviously what would you say like the two, what, if, if anyone was going to visit San Francisco today, you know, what would be the two things that you'd recommend that they would go and do in the city right now? Oh, I can't wait for people to come visiting again. Um, you know, obviously since last we spoke, I'm in a new job and I have new coworkers and I was just really excited to meet them. And then lockdown happened and I haven't met anybody in person in a long time. So I'm so excited for people to come to San Francisco. And I think my, my advice would be, if you're going to come to San Francisco, the first thing you should do is leave San Francisco and <laughs> go over the Golden Gate Bridge and do a hike at Mount Tam. Um, that's one of my favorites. There's this perfect view on the Mount Tamil Pay where you, it's an easy hike. It's, some of it's like paved. It's not, uh, not anything I would suggest if it was a hard, a hard walk, but um, you see the view looking over into the city and it's so beautiful. So that's what I would suggest first. And then um, the evening on that day, you got to come back into the city. And um, I think you should go to Lipo and get the world famous Chinese Mai Tai um, and then walk over to North Beach and get Italian food in North Beach. Um, I think that would be the perfect San Francisco day. <laughs> I think you're right. Definitely ending in North Beach is pretty great. They have a great bunch of bars there. You know, it's a great atmosphere. The food is really good. And even the places that look kind of, um, you know, you don't think they're going to be good and you go inside and suddenly it's one of the best things you've ever tasted. So I always remembered going there, which is great. For sure. Yeah. Lots, lots of good food around here. Nobody uh, is want for a good place to eat. That's right. So I remember like in the office, you know, I don't know, you know, I guess, I guess it's fine to talk about this now. We used to have like this, this I didn't really partake in this, but I remember like once I, I, you know, I joined and tasted some beers, but the office had this like kind of like group where they would have like this imported slash local beer kind of transfer. Uh, and people would obviously sit around on the table and, you know, test it out. What would be like your favorite, you know, I guess, beverage these <laughs> days, if you still, you know, if you drink, you know, obviously not everyone drinks, but. Yeah, uh, no, that, that is something I still do. <laughs> And uh, shout out to the SIG Beer Club. That's right. Uh, I hope that uh, gets started up again for those people. And uh, shout out to our friends over there that we would have beers with. Who do we have? John Tapp. John, Chris, Ernest, yep. Hari, yep. Uh, Justin, uh, Justin Collins, who I think is a, a regular on the show. He's been mentioned a few times, um, you know, Justin came and spoke about Breakman, and then obviously we had Neil on recently, who also was one of the partners who helped, you know, build the enterprise version of, of Breakman. And if I got that wrong, Justin, you can call me out. But I remember him saying, like, specifically, he only did, like, the, you know, the, the kind of more enterprise stuff and didn't do Breakman. So, um, awesome. So speaking of, sorry, go ahead. Just, uh, yeah, some history there. Yeah. Fun. 
Uh, so speaking of San Francisco, you know, we met in, at Synopsys, and I remember you were leading the product security for the research and development team. Um, you know, could you talk more about like that kind of role, and you know, what did you enjoy most about kind of like working for like you know a product lead for like security products? I really loved that role, and I was so excited to have the opportunity to do it. It was a little bit outside of uh, maybe the trajectory that I was working towards before the stars aligned. And um, I'll always be grateful to Andrew Vanderstock for um, introducing me to that role and to John Stephen for hiring me and taking a kind of leap towards a direction that I felt a lot of product security programs weren't all in towards a little different, very unique, uh, which is taking a kind of culture first approach to application security and really making an organic secure development life cycle that came from where developers lived and where basically um, by developers for developers kind of approach. And that really came from in my background where I got the ideas to really push forward with that. I would say there was an inkling that that was an interesting approach in my mind um, way back when I first got started in security. And, and in 2008, when I was working with uh, Rob Graham and Dave Maynard at Arata Security, we um, kind of put out a paper or coined a term SDL light, which was an approach to the software development life cycle that wove security practices in every step of the life cycle, but really a light touch, lightweight approach from the security team, something that startups could use and small businesses that didn't have the capital P product security team to help them. And, you know, how, how, can you incorporate security in a way that developers weave into the tools that they already have, the skills that they already have, and security is just another attribute of quality assurance. And at the time, way back in the day, that was kind of a novel idea. Um, the Microsoft SDL was king and the, the kind of big infrastructure approach that that had was leaving a few people out of the puzzle. So that's sort of the pitch that I made to, uh, to John Stephen at the time. And they took a chance because I think it really blended well with where Synopsys was in their maturity model as well. And Dawn Carroll was my manager. She uh, brought me on and we started looking at making a process out of the SDLC and bringing in from the start security champions to build that with us. And so, you know, all of the language was coming from our champions. And because Synopsys is a company that uh, sells security assurance software, um, we were really lucky in that the, uh, the, the knowledge level, the uh, awareness of the security steps, the life cycle. There was a lot of knowledge already there and we were able to just codify it in a way that made everybody just on the same page. So uh, it, it really blended well with a small product security team and a large group of developers that were given extra training and extra support to be security champions and really what was novel about it was owning most, if not all, of the security assurance process. Um, you know, it wasn't a hard sell to the Coverity software development team to use Coverity on their own code and Defensix and et cetera. So the, the sell was a bit easier, but we really got to put the model through its paces that uh, I had been kind of thinking about and mulling over for quite some time. And uh, it was really great. And um, so th the, the second part I think you were asking is like, what were the challenges? Mm -hmm. And yep, yep. I, I would say that even in a program where you are delivered all of the perfect pieces and you just have to put them together, 
it's still difficult to prioritize. You cannot boil the ocean. You cannot just do the whole, you can't roll out the whole thing all at once. And so prioritizing what's gonna be the most effective first, you know, you get your big rocks and then your quick wins and you kind of balance those. Um, so yes, starting with, uh, I think the most important piece that we had to start with was an app inventory. A, we've got all of the people, the players, we've got our process pretty well down and um, what, what now are all of our apps and pieces of software that we have to deal with? That was probably the first, the first step, the hardest part in uh, laying the foundation. It's a really difficult thing to do, but I just want to obviously you mentioned a lot there, and I kind of really resonated with the parts where, like you know, you obviously we're going to talk about security champions in a little while, um, but you were. Uh, one, obviously, the, the the way you were focusing things were very much developer focus first and like developer experience, and that's I think a you know a fundamental like thing you have to do, otherwise you're just going to fail. If it's like a very nuanced out of the way of a developer's process, and even anyone else in in their current working environment, you know, in terms of legal, sales, you know, it doesn't matter, um, kind of thing. It's really d important to make sure that they're you're doing things in the things that they know, and then you know, translating, you know, you can do very like you know hard to understand security de definitions, but without having, um, you know, the the input from the teams that are really utilizing this type of stuff. And it's, you know, the message to spread, you know, without having that kind of definition from the, the people that own it, it's, it's kind of impossible to do. And then, you know, I, I thought it was quite nice that yeah, from the um, approach of actually, you know, being given the chance of deploying this out. And obviously you are gonna fail if you try and like just classify everything. And that kind of like sounds like a very like, you know, the early days of the beginning of now, like asset inventory is the biggest thing in the world, right? You need to know like everything that's going on. And, you know, like, you know, however, you know, even even three years ago, it was a little bit more, you know, there was some people on Twitter, um, I forgot what his name, Jeremiah Grossman, when they started to like build something out for the first time. And I believe it was like four years ago, I don't know, maybe five years ago now, when they said they're going to do this thing. And or maybe it was Rumble. I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, there's a bunch of people that are in that space. And, you know, I, I just thought it was like, you know, interesting to see. And now it's like the, one of the biggest, most important things. So it was, it was yeah. really nice to hear about the, you know, the, the challenges and uh, what, you know, where you were going with that. So, um, yeah, my final question, and I obviously, I'm, if you have any other things to say to that, that's great. Um, but uh, if you were to approach that position again, what would be some of the, th like the key pieces that you would need to make sure that you're successful? If, if someone was about to go and work and try and, you know, do product security, at scale for all these teams, like various different organizations inside one large organization? Um, well, we were lucky to have such a great partner in the consulting team at Synopsys from the start. And so we really had a great map of what maturity looked like and what the steps could be. Um, and so building something from scratch, you get this great opportunity to start with the end in mind. And we had a lot of great support there. And, um, you know, seeing what uh, kind of influenced by the BSIM maturity model. Um, so seeing how many pieces there could be, every program is different, but I think it's just a matter of prioritizing as many of those pieces as you can get out given what supplies or uh, resources you have. I think the first, as I kind of mentioned, the first most important part in my mind is security champions, having partners from the start. Um, that is definitely my way. I am a people person first, people process technology, um, people gets you most of the way there. So uh, having, having partners, um, but then also um, building out your, your kind of management system. So you have um, the next place I would go is vulnerability management. How are you? Um, how are you tracking your vulnerabilities across their life cycle? And how are you establishing SLOs? Um, you know, agreements with the product teams for fixing vulnerabilities in a timely fashion. None of that happens without partnership and um, you know working with your team for realistic expectations and having the software in the background to track vulnerabilities 
it is very analogous to asset inventories, app inventory, all of this. You can't get very far unless you have a really good structure in place. Got it. So I'm going to try and recap that because I feel like there's some really like interesting pieces there. So, and obviously you can keep me saying if I'm saying things wrong. It's been a long time since I've said the word BSIM, but if someone who doesn't know that word before, it's the building security and maturity model. And basically it allows you to, uh, uh, you know, was a yeah. for six, you know, thank you. Um, yeah. So I did that for, said that for a long time, um, you know, and it basically does allow you to kind of get like a kind of full holistic view of like what your kind of maturity looks like across the board, not just at the software level, but also, you know, people and process components as well. So that kind of sometimes would allow you in, and there's open source models. There's the OWASP project, which also is, has, it's like open OWASP SAM or something like that, which is like the security assessment model or some or maturity something i'm not entirely sure it's been a been a hot minute but there is a, there is an owasp um open source one mm-hmm. yeah which you could definitely take a look at if you were looking to like use this in your own internal organizations um and then following where andrew is like what you don't know that i know please don't please, sorry andrew yeah, please, sorry. <laughs> my membership also expired so i probably should buy the, the lifetime <laughs> one so um anyway <laughs> interject um so um yeah and i also think the the component of obviously you know, you need to be able to track all the vulnerabilities that are coming in. And that for, it doesn't matter like what you're doing, if it's from like a bug bounty report, if it's from, um, you know, like SAST or DAST kind of scanning tools, or if it's just from like someone reporting it internally, you know, they kind of, you need to have a centralized place for that. And if you don't have it, it doesn't allow you to also transition into things like we're seeing a bunch of cross-site scripting happening all the time. You probably should like try and do some more developer training around that kind of thing. And you know that you know those kind of th- those 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 variables sometimes lead into other actions that you can do from like you know stuff too. So yeah, uh, one of the cool things that um, my current company at Lassian we're doing is having our own version of the top ten list. So OWASP is infamous for their top ten list, and it's it's somewhat based on like how common vulnerabilities are and. I think a really good thing to do is to try to emulate that model internally. And if you don't have a tracking system, how are you going to tell yourself what vulnerability classes are the most common for your own organization? And if you don't have that, then you don't have a lot of the credibility that you need to come to development teams and say, this is a problem. And even more leadership as well, because if they don't see the data, uh, they're going to sometimes just go, Well, you know, we're not going to trust that because we don't know. I think, yeah, so a lot of the times, like, people sometimes classify via, like, when, like, you know, know, P0s or, like, you know, you know, highs or criticals come in from, like, their, you know, either third-party resource, like, third-party, like, bug bounty reports or, like, you know, someone doing, like, a um, thing like that sometimes, like, dictates on what is going to be in your, like, top 10, for example, which is always an interesting to see how things evolve. And then that always fluctuates, too which can allow security teams to like determine, um, you know, what they're going to actually like focus on, I guess, for those kind of, you know, we need to like try and, re- you know, reduce risk at scale. How do we do that? Well, try and like reduce the current top, you know, 10. And if that suddenly changes, it means you may have moved a needle too, you know, which is quite nice. Yes. So speaking of aspects of the human side, um, you know, you know, obviously I spend a lot of time in the technical realm and sometimes we forget there's also human beings behind the screen, especially in a, um, a COVID world. Um, you know, obviously um, an organization isn't just built up of someone who works in application security where, you know, some people go in that silo and like I'm doing my application security, you know, type away. Um, but obviously there's, you know, developers, there's human resources, design, marketing, legal sales, you know, there's an entire, you know, various different streams of what makes a business. And obviously they need to be conscious about security as well. Um, so, you know, we, we've talked about like some, you know, your past of working, um, you know, as a kind of product security owner in a way, but like let, now let's move into your current role of like, you know, what can you talk about the premise around security culture and security training? Yeah, it's really exciting to see this model. Uh, some of the fundamental first principles that I've employed at previous companies I got to take that in a new direction um, and think about culture for a much larger audience, the security culture for the entire employee base. And this is an exciting challenge because there's a lot of preconceived notions about what's possible 
in a program like this. And so I really had to uh, think about things from, from scratch and really define what is culture was one of the first things that we talked about on my team. Um, and so I define culture, everyone has their own take on it or brand, but uh, for me, culture is the, the behaviors of a community or a group of people that are, def that the behaviors that sum up the values of that group. So you, the way that you kind of in, embody the values. Um, and for security culture, we want the values to be protect the customer data, be paranoid, and always put the, you know, like always take, uh, I guess, a paranoid mindset in all things and don't take anything for granted. That's the sort of thing that we want to be instilled as a value in a culture. But what actually happens is more like, the, the values are more like move fast and break things and uh, features, 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 you know, that dazzle the customer, all of those things end up being more like a, maybe a type of cultural values. And the, the road between the first part I just described and the second part has been my, my path at this uh, new role that I'm doing at Atlassian the culture and training team. Awesome. Kind of want to, yeah, like having like a paranoid mindset is like obviously super critical, but then if you get too paranoid, you don't click links and you actually don't get work done. So it becomes like a really like interesting, um, I guess, like shift in like, what do you actually do? Um, and obviously, you know, we're going to go more into like, you know, um, a lot of these components, but from what I've seen in the past, um, measuring success for this type of thing, it seems very difficult, um, you know, in my, in my if, I, if I'm doing static analysis at a company, I can look at how many vulnerabilities were found. When I write a new rule, I can see how many more vulnerabilities were found. And then we can work with the engineering team to see how many have been fixed over time. Very measurable, very easy to understand. Um, but from a security culture perspective, you know, it's like, is it phishing campaigns? Is it like a lot more than that? Like, you know, how does it, you know, you, you know how do you actually get um, like feedback to the business to be able to one get more funding so you can do more initiatives and then two like how do you actually just show, show it in, in general I'm just interested to know about that yeah I when I started I was interested too um, I, I really came into it with uh, a lot of um, again values I had a lot of things that I was hoping were true but I wasn't sure and so one of the first things that we had to do was lay out the metrics for this program. And there's actually a lot more there than I realized. And there's, there's a lot more in this industry of security, culture, and awareness practitioners. Um, a lot has happened in, to kind of innovate in this space. And I was really pleased to see that this is kind of a, a great time to be in this space. Um, there's a lot more focus now on metrics and training, not just for check a box, not just for awareness sake, but training to move the needle on behavior change. So the first thing to change the behavior is to be able to measure it. And so we work very closely with uh, the, the blue team, our kind of detection and response team and intelligence team to get the visibility into actual, uh, you know, traffic incidents, um, tasks, activities people are doing, those sorts of things. I, I don't mean for this to be that much of like a blue team talk, but detection is a lot of the same pieces that the awareness team is now using to just kind of get a feel for what humans are doing um, in, from a security perspective. And so the piece that is novel and that my team really brings to the table is this idea of showing people their own behaviors and mirroring that back to them as a way to motivate them to change. And that's really the, the kind of novel insight that I think is changing this, this story and um, making programs more successful 
is providing transparency and really pulling the veil back and showing people what's happening behind the scenes on the security team with, with their data, with uh, tracking their behavior. So privacy is another team that, um, that we wanna work closely with and just giving people that perspective. And you know we have dashboards all day long, but we don't show them to the employees. How are they ever supposed to know how their efforts fit into the big picture? Um, so we have a, a kind of risk management platform now that is something that the the, the culture team uses, but looks very similar to some of the other risk management platforms that other security teams use. Um, we talked about app inventories. This is sort of like a human risk app inventory um, with every employee and contractor, every person represented in some way in, in a platform. And then from there, you can start assigning values and weights to each behavior. And all of a sudden you've got a heat map of risk in your company and you're off and running in, in a pretty mature direction. And um, you know that looks very similar to some of the other security teams approaches and the way that a, a program matures. So yeah, um, some of this might sound new to a lot of people. It's not, it's not an area that I had done a lot of reading in two years ago, but um, yeah, there's a lot of maturity in this space and a lot of really cool tools out there now to measure people's behaviors. So I'm, that's a, I did, honestly, I didn't expect to like hear some of those things, but it kind of makes a lot of sense in the, in the way, um, especially for like transparency, right? Like transparency is, um, um, I, I forgot to disable all of the things in my stream and people are trying to claim them. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, by the way, none of that will show up. That's all muted uh, on this on this one. I normally disable it. It's just for like when I'm playing video games. Anyway, anyway. Uh, but thank you for the for the redemptions. Um, yeah, where was I going with that? So like the the transparent transparency thing is key because um, you know you get to the point where. Um, a lot of the time it's kind of like smoke and mirrors and then you just go, oh, you failed like a training or you failed, you didn't like complete this training by this day, like you have to finish it by this, this quarter or whatever. And then like, or you clicked a link in a phishing thing, like that's not the best way to really get people, you know, thinking about security. It's important and all part of the process, right? Um, but, you know, if uh, having better transparency and like showing this type of information and I never even thought about like, you know, maybe diving into the privacy side of things and like, because if people, if you're showing trust, you know, to your employees, they're probably going to trust you more with the types of things that you give to them as security activities. That's a pretty smart way of doing it. And then it kind of feels like a gamification in a way too, the way that I at least like visualize it. It's like potentially gamifying like the, the heat map type stuff, like, oh, here's a risk, we have to go squash it kind of thing. It's like very much like a gamification of, of how that, you know, looks compared to how it used to be where it's just very like straight and narrow. Yeah, I think that would definitely apply. <laughs> Um, so phishing is a big part of that, um, and we had a great exercise where we put, we help, we, sorry, we had an event and people could come and help the red team craft a phishing campaign, oh. and it just led to such a great discussion and really like pulled the curtain back and was like, oh, this is just a, a well-crafted header with a well-crafted email. There's nothing like embedded in a way that isn't a normal email. Like there's still just the pieces I'm familiar with. And we had this great uh, feedback from like, I, I think this person was from the marketing team and they're like, oh, this is just a uh, DKIM settings. And this is how you get around the spam filter. I do this all the time. And actually I would say everyone in the marketing department is very well-versed in something that is a huge part of a lot of attacks. And they actually have a really good baseline. They're, they're just imagining that there's some mysterious piece to the puzzle and really simplifying what threats actually look like from the reconnaissance stage um, was, it was really, a, it was a great way to bridge the gap and that's what we use phishing for. It's a good, uh, I think it's a good risk temperature check, but also it's just a great way to engage on a shared language that other 
those teams outside of engineering have that they might not know that they actually are farther along than they think. And so we had some really cool conversations. But at the end of the day, the, the one thing that always comes up is, well, that's a phishing simulation. I knew it was a simulation. I knew it was you guys. So I, I didn't report. I didn't act the way that I would have otherwise. And very helpful, very useful conversations come out of that and discussions. But one of the hardest things about the phishing program right now is getting people to take it to practice like they would play, to take it seriously. And so that's where we just need to double down and bring people even further into our thought process and be like, we need you to show us how you would react in a real situation for our metrics and we make our dashboards visible. If we can get people to feel like they're a part of our team, their partners, then they're not doing it necessarily for their own safety, but they're doing it as a favor for the security team. That works too, you know, that they want to be a part of our process. Um, you know, that only happens with transparency, partnership, organic growth, that sort of thing. Nice. Yeah, it kind of makes sense that like, you know, the marketing and sales people probably are really good at getting around email spam because obviously they need to reach people. And they probably have already figured out all the tricks and Googled all the different ways you might be able to like make sure your emails look accurate because of imaging, et cetera. So yeah. I can totally understand how they actually might be better at creating this type of stuff. And I remember people when I used to work in, in like, you know, in the red teaming side, like a long time ago, like back in 2013, 2014, um, they basically would say like that salespeople make the best like you know fishers and also like you know um, someone that's going in to try and break into a building because they know how to craft craft a, a a good story and a good mission and people follow good missions and stories so really interesting to kind of see how that how that evolves. Totally, it also reminds me of like uh, intentionally dating myself, but it reminds me of MySpace. How for a moment in time we had so many people that had access to embedding code. And they just sort of figured out what parts were useful to them. And then, you know, we had we had Sammy Kamkar in the mix because it just sort of organically connected the dots in people's minds. And it wasn't as mysterious as they thought it was. And so you can, um, I, I truly believe for myself uh, that uh, everybody has the ability to learn this information. And it just takes figuring out what their learning style is and experience uh, and a bit of motivation. But all of this, I'm, I have the firm belief that all of this is accessible and it shouldn't be a mysterious ivory tower that uh, you know, code and security are, are not something that only the security team should understand. It's a very smart way to do it. And obviously, Sammy is my hero. So <laughs> we'll move on from that. Um, so um, let's go with, um, the, like, so I'm, I'm interested to know about, like, how do you effectively train people uh, who, who don't have security background to do security work? I know we kind of touched upon that a little bit, but obviously there's some key pieces I'm sure that you might be able to, like, distill um, into, like, how you actually kind of get people interested who just aren't, like, you know, they don't need to know about security, really, but they do from, like, a, you know, paranoid perspective. Um, so there's two pieces in the program, as I think of it. There's training for ability and training for motivation. And the training for ability can have some of the classic click-through trainings that you're probably thinking. Um, or its labs. And then training for motivation looks very different. That's going to be experiential and much more telling the story. And like I kind of mentioned, giving people an insight into what impact them learning these things has. And it's, it's just a much more well-rounded picture than a lot of training programs are giving it credit. So when you have people that are getting motivation out of the training and the experiences, as well as knowledge and ability and awareness, uh, then you've got a much more complete program. Awesome. And then 
Following on from that, it's like, what are the right activities that non-security people should really engage in for security? I know we kind of touched upon that as well, where it was like, maybe they get them involved in phishing, but are there any other things that you might be able to engage people for from like a non-security perspective? Every company is different. Your mileage may vary, but um, I think that I, I want to give a, a disclaimer or a caveat that I am in no way saying that the technology shouldn't be also in a very big part of in the mix. So for example, I think that giving people um, motivation and ability training around phishing is definitely one part of it because people, you know, they're they're outside, they're in the world, they're outside of your network and they bring things in. So it's important to do training, but that is entirely in partnership with uh, MFA, zero trust boundaries and having a technology solution that provides a backstop. So having people engaged is one thing. And then there's this technology element as well, a protection in place uh, to provide the rest of the distance in, in all of these situations. Uh, so for phishing, one of the big backstops is MFA, but we still have password reuse as a problem, and as well as like some, you know, some token problems that don't quite get all the way covered. And um, so that's an example. And um, what are those for your company? You have to do a kind of risk assessment at the technology level. What are the most important behaviors for you to respond to and get people to behave differently towards? And then you know, formulate a plan that involves all of the security teams. Um, so for us, training, uh, phishing, and responding to social engineering in general, just to bring that out to a bigger perspective, um, password, um, kind of password hygiene, using a password manager, that sort of thing, and then um, updates, device type stuff, I think all of that is things that employees understand as their purview. It's either something that they touch or something that they input. All of that feels like it's germane to the employee's responsibility to know how to work securely about. I see. It kind of feels like obviously some of those things are, you know, everyone, some people just go, well, that's obvious, but it's obviously a really key part, right? Because um, especially like if someone just joins a company for the first time, like in their onboarding, there probably should be like some type of like security kind of culture thing. And then like, you know, hey, like you can use like one password like for here and here is our like discount code or something. Or like this is the mandatory thing we have to use for our organization that basically like starts the process of preventing password reuse, like realistically, because they're going to start using this thing, especially for the least, you know, logging into the corporate corporate organization, right? And then, and then again, with like multi-factor authentication, like you can do it from like a, an engineering perspective where you require everything to go through like single sign-on through like Okta or whatever. Um, and that's obviously a business decision, but then obviously it's then like making, you know, the conscious decision of making everyone install like a particular, you know, like multi-factor tool on their device or giving them UB keys when they get hired or something. So there's all those kind of processes that you can take. And that generally leads to a, like a more secure solution over time because it's like how you, th if I think about it in the application security world, it's like, if you can put things in the framework, then, you know, the vulnerabilities tend to go away, you know, there, you know, if you put like the ability to do, you know, contextual output encoding in a, fra a client side framework, the risk definitely lowers. And it's, I think it's the same for like how most organizations think about things too. Yeah, for sure. To, to steal the phrase, there's a paved road for employee behaviors as well. Paved. I did. A, I, I saved the quote and then I lost it. Um, but I really liked your, and we're going to get into this now is like, it was like training is like a full time. I, I, so I will link um, in the VOD, um, Marissa's amazing like, RSA talk with a few other, uh, you know, awesome women who have been working in this space as well. I have one from, I believe, Slack and Fortunately, forgot the other, the other company was. Um, but yeah, so uh, <laughs> it was a really good video. And then like, you basically said something along the lines of um, like training is a, like a, a continuous process and then something else. And I, it was really smart and I didn't save it. So I'm really upset. So do you remember the quote that you said? Or? Oh, I, I don't know. I, 
I thought it, I thought it was oh. very good though. Maybe I'll timestamp it and stick it in the bod. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Okay. The talk is a, an, I think an RSA conference lightning talk. It's only seven minutes, so I wouldn't want to spoil it. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that my, my perspective is just that security is a journey. You know, it's about prioritizing and doing things one behavior at a time. You can't boil the ocean. So starting, um, I, don't, I don't think this was necessarily the context, but starting with one behavior that has been identified as like a big risk because you've done your most common, most common risks assessment and then going to two and three, building your program slowly over time and is, is just part of the, the maturity journey uh, is, is the only way to do it. That's basically what I was trying to get, but my brain doesn't work sometimes. So, um, But that kind of like leads me into what we're going to talk about, you know, for the final piece of this, this um, stream is, um, you know, security training in general. Like, I believe you probably have some good pros I mean, insight into, you know, how someone might build this from the ground up again. Like, do you want, like, the first question would be, do you, should you build something internally or should you buy something? Like, what are the general pain points for, like, trying to build out a security training platform? Because you can, like, you know, you need mandatory stuff and you sometimes need custom stuff, but what does that generally look like and what would you recommend? Uh, so the security awareness training and developer training both have this in common. You probably need a mix of blend, a blended approach that covers a lot of ground with different, you know, people learn different ways. So the more types of learner you can cover, the, the more mature your program is. And like I said, you start with one and then you, you build over time. So there's no right way. Um, people are just earlier in their program or further along in their program. Uh, but I, I think that you get a lot of early bang for your buck by purchasing a off the shelf training, but you need to make sure that your off the shelf training has very good learning management software features. Um, security training made by security teams often has the downside of not having learning management system basics really baked in very well. Uh, there's a lot of features that learning specialists understand are extremely important to the adoption and rollout of a program. It's not enough to just have a interface where code compiles, you have to be able to send out and remind people, send out email reminders, track, track completion for your compliance audit, like all of this stuff that is behind the scenes. Uh, so there are companies out there that sell the total package and you should definitely hold out until you find one that seems like it covers all of the boxes, but make sure that your training has an interactive element and that it's fun and interesting. And I was happy to see when I did my kind of bake off and research that those vendors are out there now, that training in general has gotten a lot better. And um, <laughs> I, I won't mention any names for, uh, so that nobody's mad at me, but um, <laughs> I was just really excited to see that, that uh, a lot of the vendors are doing some really cool things in the space with interactive lab environments. And uh, having a lab environment plus being able to track for completion and being able to do that housekeeping behind the scenes is the total package. And it's great to see some of them now are doing this. So I feel like if you reach out to Marissa on, on Twitter and like DM her, if she has them open, I'm sure if you ask her, um, you know, what is some good options, I'm sure she might answer it behind the scenes, maybe not on a public forum. <laughs> um, that, sounds fair. that sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about, you know, mandatory training versus tailored, you know, content, because I feel like there's always this kind of, um, you know, everyone knows about, like, you have to do your compliance training this year. Um, but like, what else are the potential things that people could do to like make tailored content that's actually useful for their organization? Like it could even be like marketing, it could be sales, but also developers as well. And how do you do it for a global audience and during a pandemic? Yes. Um, it used to be that we would just get everybody in a room together and do a lab. And if you were lucky, you had an ILT instructor to run the lab, or it was you know something that kind of was just self-explanatory, but everybody would get together. 
And that hasn't happened for many years, way too many years. Uh, so now everything is online and virtual and uh, just sort of leaning very heavily on Zoom recordings, getting product security team to do a little write up and a blog post and then record a little something, put it up on Zoom and then put the recording up in your LMS and don't let the, don't let great be the enemy of good with this. The more things you can put up in a timely fashion, the better. So a lot of, um, a lot of the training companies are trying to do this too, just to put up little nano modules, little snippets as things in the news happen, as vulnerabilities become important to address. Um, so that, that has been a really nice pairing with our um, off the shelf training is a just a an ongoing addition of internal blog posts and little video snippets. Um, and as well as we have our security champions program that is a, a community that has a good Slack presence where people can kind of chat and talk to each other and share about the news of the day. Yeah, that's obviously, you know, I've seen like people starting to use like things like Zoom and like breakout sessions and like being able to still do like collaborative things, which is quite nice. And, you know, obviously I, I think we haven't really covered this, but you can do like lunch and learns and you can do, you know, which obviously you can't really do in person now, which you could do over Zoom <laughs> or, you know, you know, whatever, or Teams or whatever anyone uses. Uh, and obviously you can do like capture the flags and like those types of things too, which is like quite nice, not always applicable to everyone, but you know, you get different levels of people that might want to do different things or maybe partake. So obviously want to try and be inclusive as possible. Uh, we're going to like finally move down to the last section, which is security champions. So obviously it's been mentioned a lot, um, but you know, what is really like a security champion at its heart and you know, how do you normally find security champions for an organization? Because, you know, Asking a manager to give one of their engineer or someone like, please make them do other things outside of their like deadlines is really hard sometimes. So I'm sure people would love to hear more about how, how you might approach that. Yeah, uh, it does certainly have challenges. And also it's another one of those things where everybody's different. Um, all programs have a different take on this. Um, so in the the three companies that I've run security champions programs, the thing that they all have in common is that they are a nominated, not self, uh, not self volunteered, a nominated person that has their manager's endorsement and is responsible for being a liaison to the security team, doesn't necessarily own vulnerability remediation but acts as a person, a developer that has been trained in an advanced level of security compared to other developers and is part of a community, an internal community that keeps themselves aware of what's going on with the security landscape, uh, announcements from the security team, and is a POC if we, we hate to see it, but if there's ever a P0 and things need to happen very quickly, that POC phone tree becomes very important. Um, somebody that educates themselves on the latest SLO pronouncements and um, somebody that can be an advocate for security in those standups and discussions where the security team is not invited. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, sometimes, you know, there's always good to have those separations because there's like kind of there's sometimes a lot of, you know, frustration and um, you know, frustration and I, you know, sometimes resentment between teams, which obviously is unfortunate, but you know, there's sometimes organizations are massive and there's like 17 different, you know, chains down those things um until you get to where you need to be. Um I definitely think a security champion is obviously um, a great partner too, because they allow you to like transfer the, like the, like the wording and the language, you know, into a lot of things too, which is why like that customization of those like solutions that you were talking about are so paramount, because if you just start saying words, which don't make sense to them, you know, it's kind of like irrelevant. So it's a really important piece as well. Yeah. Having a, having a voice, each champion contributing to standards language and 
buying buying in or signing off on new standards as they come through um, standards or guidelines, whatever you call your um, kind of security commandments <laughs> requirements. Yep. All of that needs to come organically as a partnership from security champions. They've come to the table. Rodsack needs to come to the table and write those together. So I have a few questions myself, but there's one from the stream. Um, it says, Marissa, any experiences with the reference architecture program uh, with, uh, and any tips for scaling creation of such architectures with like security champions? And um, so oh. I think, you know, the questions around like, you know, building like, you know, reference architecture for like design and those types of things. And how could you like kind of embed that into like the security champions? Because I'm sure they have a lot more experience and knowledge, I guess, in, in that domain. I am not familiar with that as a term. So like, um, like threat modeling. thanks a lot for the question. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, what if I, I will just say if it's like a kind of a program of any kind and you need security champions to help with the rollout, this happens all year long. There's new architectures and new programs and new versions of the paved road that you want to roll out. Um, you know, I think that it's just a matter of, it's a classic communications plan. Do you have a monthly touch point with the champions? And if so, you can have your subject matter experts come in and present at the touch point meeting and talk about what's expected, what the steps are, and, you know, have a moment, a call for comments and let people voice their um, reservations about any program. And then um, I, I am a big fan. There's also a training element. So enablement, getting your uh, engineers to have what they need. It's all just, you know, roll out. And this isn't always the answer that people want to hear, but do you have a program manager that is in charge of this rollout? It really helps to have somebody that is in charge of driving the steps and the, the communication of those steps to all of the stakeholders. So a kind of cop out answer, not knowing exactly what the question was, but yeah. uh, I hope in general it emphasizes that the security champions program is a community manager, um, you know, the program manager, community manager, it is a community of people that are uh, you know, they've shown their interest and now they are relying on you to meet them halfway and provide a lot of value in, in giving them the tools that they need. Yeah. I think if I would maybe add some stuff to that, I think, you know, a lot of the things is about, you know, ref for reference architecture type stuff, it's more about like, pat like pattern design and stuff. And how can you, you know, enable people to have reusable things where, <laughs> you know, you can kind of, you know, kind of give them the building blocks would be maybe a good thing. Um, like I just spend all my time looking at like, you know, code these days. So I don't look too much more at the architecture. It's more, you know, more at the code level. Um, but I, I think like at least the way that I've seen like most success for like people to adopt and, you know, maintain things is to try and give them as much re reusable information as possible. And then, you know, give them like the, the stepping stones or like a golden template to then build upon. Um, that's generally like how I would have focused things in, in SAS. It might not, you know, affect into reference architecture. But yeah, I think, you know, the comment was for you, from your side is communication, enablement, training. So I think that was kind of where you're going with helps yeah. in general. So uh, another thing is the knowledge base. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on what ends up being a confluence solution. Uh, having a knowledge base that is something everybody contributes to can be really critical for self-service, for having people know what they need to do and explaining technical uh, technical concepts and processes. We have a lot of people that give us the feedback that they don't want to hear videos. They just want to read an, a wiki article and their own time self-service. So it really is, a, this is not an answering to the question either, but um, just again, just acknowledging that you have a lot of different types of learners, a lot of different types of engineers that need information different ways and paying some service to all of the different communication channels is important. Yeah, I think there's obviously approaches for that too, right? It's like you have your article, which obviously normally like explains everything at a very like, you know, rundown level, or there's, hey, here's what the design looks like, or hey, here's a, a Docker instance that you can spin up and, you know, basically this, this you can use this securely kind of thing. Um, and then 
you know, onto that, you could then do, you know, virtual sessions where you, you know, go to a forum where the developers live and then, you know, newsletters, I don't know, um, or also like video explanations too, like where you do like a, like a brown bag or something virtually so to try and get people to adopt it rather than, and then like maybe handoff adoption eventually when people start to adopt it. It's hard to do that because no one wants to maintain things that they didn't make. So how do you do that? That's very hard for me. Um, and then a final question, um, you know, how do you partner with your security champions to enable success? I think we kind of already covered this, but like, it would be nice to know, like maybe some tips to make sure that some of these partnerships continue to be fruitful rather than we tried to do it once, didn't really go very well, let's not try again kind of thing. Well, um, there's the program itself and then there's the people in it. So both have success metrics. Um, an individual feeling success in the program, um, maybe it isn't a forever after relationship. So there's like a critical first 90 days of onboarding into the program and they get a lot of quick wins and they do a lot of the trainings right off the bat. And there's often just like an energy to complete all of our suggestions right away. And then after 90 days and they've done 15 tasks, you know, ideally, in the great ideal situation. Then we're like, oh, well, there's not, we, we don't have any other ideas. And then they go through a lull idle period of like their team isn't seeing a lot of vulnerability tickets. And also they've run through all of our trainings that we suggest and it's a month until the next community meeting. Um, so there's this idle period. And um, that, could lead to a person just wanting to quit or opt out or saying that they have gotten all they needed out of it. And maybe it's time for another person on their team to take the baton and be that person. And I don't consider any of that a failure. That's exactly what needed to happen. The program is still a success. As long as the baton does get passed to a new person because we need that POC at the end of the day, somebody needs to have the security champion hat on. And I think a very healthy program would have a good structure for people to be able to jump into the seat and jump out of it. Uh, we have a pretty decent program set up using JIRA tickets for tasks and people can onboard and then see what they're supposed to do. And, and that sort of, you know, you assign the tickets and all of that is kind of um, meeting developers where they live. It, it really works well for us. Um, but the program itself. So we have a few behaviors that we consistently ask of champions, and then we count whether they do them or not. That is one of the metrics for whether the program is successful. Um, we've got a kind of active status kind of mentality of if, um, if a person is idle and they haven't passed the baton, that is the situation that we're trying to hedge against and the health metric of our of our program. Gotcha. Yeah, I totally blanked because I saw like two questions pop in before uh, we came in. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of that is um, blanked. So let's just jump over to the questions and maybe my, my thought process will come back. Uh, if you said that, if you um, obviously want to be conscious of time, it's nearly three. So uh, do you, okay. I have two, there's two questions and then we can That's make good. it quick. Okay. So the behavioral engineering branch for the Paranoids at Yahoo partners internally with their red team uh, versus your team partnering with your blue team. Do you think the difference in the red team and blue team respective informs what you choose to focus on for goals, metrics, or behavioral change? Ah, uh, but I told two stories, partnering with red team and blue team, um, not calling it purple team because I'm not sure if I'm saying that uh, that has a new connotation. But yeah, um, the most common risk, uh, you know, the list that we're trying to work against, it does have detection at its heart. It is something that comes from the, the intelligence team identifying what the most common risks are, but it also comes from CorpSec, from the internal security team looking at our network. So is that also blue team? I, I don't know if uh, InfoSec or CorpSec gets really their, their due as part of that. Um, and so we're really 
we're really taking information from all sides in the program. Um, at the end of the day, also doing a lot of our own analysis. Our, if the fishing program is entirely our own, we're doing our own analysis as well and hoping to grow that in a much bigger direction of like social engineering in general over time. Um, awesome shout out to the Yahoo Paranoids for the behavioral engineering team. They've kind of coined a bunch of these techniques and their the recent white paper that they put out is definitely worth a read. I'll put that in the, the, the pod so people can watch it. I also get like every time you kept saying, you know, POC, I kept thinking like proof of concept and I was like, oh yeah, it's per, uh, personal contact. <laughs> it was uh, in my head. I was like, hmm. Um, and there was fi yeah, final one. Uh, and then obviously we'll let you, like, allow you to enjoy the wonderful Friday um, that is today. Uh, any advice when it comes to helping developers understand the security requirements for a security design review? I guess like, you know, like threat modeling. Um, how can we help our developers understand um, the security needs of the company so they um, obviously can develop with a security mindset? Awesome, awesome question. Uh, Two-part question. Um, so we get a lot of our fireside chat kind of communication out of this monthly meeting that we have with the champions. And uh, we have different guest speakers come in and leadership, you know, for example, and share from, from their own mouths, what is important. And that's, that's one approach is to just tell them what's important to the business. And, um, and then I think they see it as well and how we respond to specific vulnerabilities that come in. You know, how did Log4j, how did that go? And what emphasis did we put on it? A lot of that for a lot of people came on a Thursday and a Friday. Did we ask people to stay late or did we not like how much emphasis got put on it from our side? And I think people will, you know, they mirror what you do. They will want to meet the level of expectation if you can communicate that properly. So our, our Slack channel and our monthly meetings, touch points, all of that does a long way to communicate importance. And then we have a training. Um, we've got vulnerability management training and threat modeling training. Um, on threat modeling specifically, it's actually threat modeling light. We would not have a, um, we wouldn't roll out a training to all thousands of developers that had the expectation that people could do threat modeling. That's not gonna happen. But we do have a training that talks about it and a training that introduces a light exercise that is, uh, it's a light stride exercise. And it's a good thought experiment. It's a good exercise to go through and it's very leading. You know, you have a, um, an ideal situation in the training that has lots of juicy STRID and E's that you can pick out. Um, but then the idea is that they will take that thought exercise and apply it when they're doing their design documents. And that part is really hard to say if that's actually happening, but um, we do get to track how many people are going through the training, how many people request a shadow, um, you, you can request help from the security team, how many people are requesting a shadowing of a threat model and that sort of thing. And that's a sort of commentary on how good the communication is, is how well people are taking advantage of the training alongside it. Um, yeah, so just from another perspective, threat modeling, keep it, keeping it simple, take the concepts that are important and maybe, maybe it's not as important to get all of the different facets. What are, what are the most important ones? And uh, take, take the low hanging fruit out of that exercise. I think that's some really good advice and with that thank you everyone that watched today and people were thanking you for some great tips in the stream so thank you for being here today um again obviously it's been two years let's hopefully it's our next time we see each other isn't going to be another two so yes. well i'll see you at, at atwater in mission bay <laughs> yep see you soon uh so <laughs> that was episode 16 of security and crumpets join us next time for episode 17.